Okay, and I hope you can record to your computer also, Doug. And hopefully they won't collide and et cetera. Okay, we're going to uh, try this and see if we can get Zoom. And Doug, uh, hopefully on your computer, you're seeing me as the uh, main viewer and the talker right now. I was, was everybody up there. Okay. Um, does anybody know on Zoom how I can show myself as the main thing? There. Okay. Okay. Um, I want to welcome everyone to the August 2023 meeting of the 1904 World's Fair Society. I'm Mike Truex, and this year, for your information, is the 119th anniversary of the 1904 World's Fair. And it's also the 37th anniversary of the 1904 World's Fair Society. Today we'll see an interesting and somewhat different presentation about the World's Fair because it's mainly about events that took place after the fair and a very important legacy that is left from the fair and its operations. Now we also have several attendance prizes that were on the table as you came in. I hope everyone signed up so we can uh, draw your names out and everyone can go home with either some postcards or stereo views or spoons. I'd like to first ask if there's any uh, new members here tonight or non-members. Raise your hand. Ah, yes, over on the my right and left over here. Would you please stand up and give us a brief, uh, introduce yourself and a brief summary of how you found about the, so the society? Well, I'm also interested in what uh, my grandmother is both very excitedly about it and was dreaming in. Um, she at the time was 12 and uh, she worked in a shirt factory. So she did piece work. So this was the moment of her life and she probably had her own money that she could spend at the fair. Of course, they had wanted them to do the uh, educational exhibit in the large family that they wanted to go to the live and stuff. Like that. Um, I, I found out about the society because there uh, you had a booth, uh, Mike had a booth, and um, there were items there, and it was right around this time, right around my birthday. And my daughter said, whatever you want, pick it out, and I will get it for you. Mm -hmm. And then we were talking, and you gave me the literature about the uh, society, and it took me a while. But I saw uh, at the closing of the exhibit at the uh, History Museum, and I joined at that time. Then I started school. So this is my first meeting, even though I joined at, at that time. So I'm very excited to be here. We are so glad to have you. <laughs> Welcome, Bridget. Anybody else that I see another hand go up? Okay. Uh, and it, or did I miss one? Anybody else new or first time in years that you've been at a meeting? Oh, somebody's pointing at someone else over there. Uh, will that someone else uh, stand up and reintroduce yourself? Okay. Well, great, great. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, great. Welcome to our meeting and the society. Make sure you get some of the free handouts on the table back there and, uh, you know, take a look at joining. I think everyone here, you know, really has a lot of fun with the fair and learns about it. How many people are still learning about the fair? Okay. We all are. And I've been doing it for 25 years. 
Okay, uh, administrative reminder, please silence your cell phones so we don't have ringing in the middle of this because we are recording it. Uh, I hope all attendees signed up for the attendance prizes. I think I mentioned that already. Uh, postcards and stereo views and some souvenir spoons, all from the fair. Uh, be sure and visit the Society website regularly. The handouts have it at the bottom. And it's really hard to remember, 1904worldsfairsociety.org. Uh, the upgraded website has been released. It provides information about upcoming meetings. You can produce, purchase our society merchandise there and pay online. It also has pictures from our past meetings and also last year's, last couple of years worth of bulletins and other reports. Also check the Facebook group. There's almost 6,000 members of that uh, and memorabilia and questions and answers and pictures of the fair are always being posted there. And also Holly often posts very neat and unusual views of the fair on our Instagram page. How many people here do Instagram and follow people? Oh, there's a couple. Uh, check out the World's Fair Society page there too. There's a lot of followers. And on U YouTube, there are over 15 society meeting presentations from the last oh, two and a half years or so that have been recorded and they can be viewed anytime on YouTube. In your meeting reminder, how many people got the meeting reminders on email? Okay, if you're not getting the meeting reminders, please see me and make sure we've got your email correct. We send out usually two reminders for each meeting. And the first one did not have the Zoom information in it. Apologies to the Zoom people out there. But the second one did. And hopefully we've got that those 10 or 12 people that signed up on Zoom on there. But you can go out to the World's Fair Society channel with one click and find those dozen or so meetings that are out there. Uh, and we'll be getting more of them out there. And this meeting will be put out there, you know, in a, probably next few weeks or so. Uh, we have a couple of board members here. I just want to ask if you have any information to share with everybody else. Linda? Just the website. Check it out. The website is very cool. Linda's been working on that for a long time and uh, finding out about free plugins that we don't have to pay for to do what we want them to do and uh, not the easiest thing to find sometimes. Uh, and Doug, in the back of the room, do you have anything? Uh, no, but you're full on both of our tours. So any names I take from now on are going to be that. Okay. Uh, there will be a waiting list is, uh, established. And thank you all who have signed up for the tours. Uh, we're talking about the tours of Bell Fountain Cemetery on September 2nd, Saturday at 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock. Yeah. Um, and Dan Fuller, our former treasurer and master guide out at Bell Fountain Cemetery, will take a bus full of people, about 28, 24 people per bus, total of 48 people. Is that the right numbers there, I think? Yep. Okay. And uh, go on about an hour and a half tour of Bell Fountain Cemetery okay. and learn a lot more about all the World's Fair people that are interred there. Okay. Now I'd like to set the stage for this presentation by traveling, traveling back and taking you back in time to Wednesday, August 17th, 1904, 119 years ago. The fair had been open for three and a half months already. It was halfway over. Every day was special and busy. With the relatively mild summer so far, the crowds kept getting larger and larger. A coup of sorts took place in the admissions department. A new administrator took charge, William Tuttle. He immediately issued an order that all free passes must be revalidated. He slashed employee pay by one third. That probably did not make him very popular. He said the revalidation would ensure that everyone have to pay their admission, and that included employees. And that probably enamored him to all the employees. Also, on August 17th, a group of 194 Chinese people arrived. They were measured by the Bertillon identification method and also fingerprinted before they were taken to the Chinese village on the pike. The U.S. Customs put 20 guards on duty, and they joined another 100 Chinese guards. Uh, the Chinese and the U.S. were worried about defectors, uh, you know, trying to get out and just settle in St. Louis. They were all there in the Chinese village 
to ensure that no Chinese left the concession unless they were accompanied by a U.S. government representative. And finally, 119 years ago, the Olympics were underway and the Olympics gymnastics competition took place in the model gymnasium, which for a long, long time was called Francis Gymnasium. And now it's a uh, fitness center, but the front of it is still there looking with the towers, just like the old Francis Gym. Mm -hmm. A German American immigrant, George Iser, competed with the Concordia Turnverein St. Louis Club. Back in 1904, all of the Olympic competitors were sponsored by teams from the big cities in the US or the big cities in Europe. They were not national teams up until about 1920, after World War I. So George Iser went on a tear gymnastics league. He won the gold medal in the parallel bars and the 25-foot rope climb. He tied for first in the vault. He also won the silver medal on the pommel horse and the all-around and the bronze medal in the horizontal bar. In one day, he won six medals. Pretty darn good. And it's even more remarkable because Iser's left leg was made out of wood. He lost most of that leg as a youth when he was run over by a train. Uh, he immigrated in his teens and obviously with the Turnverein, the athletic competitions that he was in, he kept his upper body uh, coordination and strength going really good and became an Olympian and did pretty well for himself. And now it's time for our presentation. And for those on Zoom, if you have any questions for the presenter, please enter them into the Zoom comments and Doug Stone will be monitoring those and we'll ask those at the end of the presentation. And I'd like to introduce our speaker for tonight, Karen Gehring. Karen is the Managing Director of Admission and Operations for the Missouri History Museum. And I don't believe this, but she says, told me she has worked at the History Museum for over 40 years in various positions, and she now serves as the Chief Operating Officer for the museum. I don't think that could be more than 25 years myself, Karen. Mm -hmm. But I'd like to uh, introduce Karen Gehring to come up and take care of uh, the presentation, and I'll bring Zoom up for everyone to see, or bring PowerPoint up. Let's see. You gotta go to Zoom. Good evening. The Is that better? Okay. This evening I'm going to be talking about the Jefferson Memorial Building in Forest Park. Um, which has long been the home of the Missouri Historical Society and was the last official act of the Louisiana Purchase um, Exposition Company. The, the board of directors of the LPE had decided early on that they wanted to do some sort of monument to Thomas Jefferson. Originally, it was not a building. And what you see here is one of Kessler's drawings of an early proposal for the Jefferson Monument. And it's pretty interesting because they were talking about it being either an odalisk honoring Thomas Jefferson or a statue. And the location was on uh, Government Hill. Uh, the thought was that it would be um, elevated in a place of, of honor, and then with cascading gardens around it. 
Um, there was some discussion that Carl Bitter's um, ball relief of the signing of the Louisiana Purchase would be part of it, but it was more or less decorative in, in concept. After the fair, they started thinking about this and the executive committee decided they wanted to go grander and they wanted to have a building that honored Jefferson. They kept the idea of the statue, but they added wings and the it wasn't long before um, an agreement was made and the East Wing was going to be the home of the Missouri Historical Society and the West Wing with its Jefferson Hall was going to be the home of the Louisiana Purchase Exposition Historical Association as well as having meeting rooms for various civic and um, organizations. The, um, the board of directors commissioned uh, Isaac Taylor, who was the um, individual that was in charge of architecture at the fair to come up with some designs. And um, he was authorized to design something that could be built for $350,000. Now, everyone knows David R. Francis and we're very fortunate at the Historical Society to have the papers as well as the printed materials relating not only to the fair, but also to David R. Francis. On March 15th, 1911, Francis succeeded in his negotiations with the city uh, regarding allowing the Missouri Historical Society to, to be a tenant of the soon to be built Jefferson Memorial Building. An ordinance had to be approved um, in order for this to happen. And there was urgency to this. So the ordinance was passed on March 15th. The Louisiana Purchase Exposition Companies um, incorporation papers were set to expire on April 20th of 1911. So they were kind of down to the wire. Uh, no new business could be transacted after April 20th, but they could continue with projects that had already been authorized by the board of directors. And so designs were quickly approved groundbreaking ceremony was held on April 8th of 1911, just 12 days prior to the dissolution of the corporation. And as a consequence, as I mentioned earlier, the Jefferson Memorial Building uh, with the monument, um, monumental sculpture of Thomas Jefferson became the last official act of the organization. He, David R. Francis was, was very proud of this lasting legacy uh, to the fair. And one of the things that he wrote in his um, 1913 book about the fair was that the Jefferson Memorial was a superb monument of beauty, dignity, and symmetry, making the main entrance, marking the main entrance of the fair. It's the home of the Missouri Historical Society and the repository of many interesting and valuable records of the Louisiana Purchase, as well as the archives and relics of the exposition. A tribute to a great American whose purchase of the Louisiana Territory, the Universal Exposition of 1904 was held to commemorate. A worthy consum consummation of a great undertaking by a patriotic people, the pride of every right-thinking citizen. And the cost to the present writing is, and I love the fact that this is down to the penny, 
$565.03. Now, there were four lasting legacies in terms of uh, Forest Park. So we had the St. Louis Art Museum, um, the Monument uh, to St. Louis, the World's Fair Pavilion, and then the Jefferson Memorial. Um, construction of the Jefferson Memorial actually took two years, um, a year longer than originally planned, which is somehow appropriate with the fair originally being planned for 1903. Um, and the, the $476,000 that they spent, if you translate that to $2,023, it would have been um, fourteen million seven hundred fifteen thousand dollars. Here you see an early image of the Jefferson Memorial, and there were three individuals initially that the um, organization um, selected. I see, let's move, we'll try to get rid of my toolbar there. Oh, is the toolbar showing up there? I'm sorry. Yeah, but it's not showing up on Doug's. I don't know. Is there a way to hide that? There. <laughs> that seems better, I think, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's somebody in the waiting room. Oh, oh, there's a little X there. Yeah. You see the little X uh -huh. right there? Hit that little X right there. Ah. Okay. And then okay, now you push her down. Okay, that's I think better. All right. So the three people that were selected to design the Jefferson Memorial, Isaac Taylor, who had been um, head of the uh, architecture at the fair, uh, Kessler, um, the landscape architect, and then Carl Bitter. Um, who had been in charge of sculpture uh, for the fair. Now, this is an early sketch from the Isaac Taylor architectural firm. Um, note that in this rendition, um, the loggia has a dome. Uh, it has a curved, um, uh, almost a rotunda inside uh, the loggia area. <clears throat> The, um, it's very interesting that David R. Francis was involved in every little detail that was occurring. Um, considering the various positions that he had had, you know, being mayor, being governor, et cetera, it seems somewhat unusual that he was so involved in the day-to-day -day activities and the um, and every little detail, he personally negotiated um, the contract with Carl Bitter, the sculpture, and uh, we're as I mentioned earlier very fortunate to have um, the letters and the uh, documentation of the negotiations. And since it's kind of hard to read the little letter. Um, the this was what was accepted. It was a total of twenty five thousand dollars, and for this, bidder was going to make a scale model of the Jefferson statue, and then a full size model of the statue and the pedestal. He would provide um, the block of white marble. He would oversee the carving of the Jefferson uh, statue. He would provide all transportation, uh, insurance, and installation of the completed statue. He would enlarge and remodel uh, the purchase group, and it came back, didn't it? <laughs> um, You can get rid of it? Yeah, I'm waiting on Ah, okay. Um, and then um, would cast, transport, insure, and install the Louisiana Purchase Group. 
So for a total of 25,000, um, moving that into 2023 dollars, $804,000 would have been the um, cost of that work. The um, Missouri Historical Society um, was still meeting in the old Larkin Mansion um, at the time that the construction began. And this was their first uh, permanent home where they moved in the 1880s. And the, um, the only remaining um, building from that area is the Campbell House. And this, um, the home of the Missouri Historical Society was about a block away from the, the Campbell House that, that we know. Uh, William K. Bixby is in the center of um, this, this meeting room. And this was about the time that they were making the plans to, to move into Forest Park. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, they just, squeaked by in terms of getting everything authorized before they legally had to dissolve the corporation. And this is a photograph of the day of the groundbreaking ceremony. Uh, the site, as uh, this group knows very well, was at the original entrance to the World's Fair, um, approximately Lindell and De Bolivar. And I, I really like this particular image because in the corner of it, mm -hmm. it says the Jefferson Monument for the Louisiana Purchase Exposition Company. And then it's located in Forest Park, uh, Isaac Taylor Architect, James Stewart and Company um, contractor. And then um, the short ceremony included uh, David R. Francis using the shovel uh, that he had used for the groundbreaking ceremony for the World's Fair. And then um, the Idris Ed, who at the time was the archivist and curator and librarian, it was a very small staff at the time, of the Missouri Historical Society, used um, an ancient hoe from the collection, uh, a stone implement to also break ground uh, during the ceremony. And this was um, covered uh, extensively by the local press. Uh, this particular image is from the St. Louis Republican. The, um, this is from the St. Louis Republican as well, September 21st, 1911. And construction is um, well underway in terms of particular parts. Um, this is an image of um, the capitals for the various stone columns uh, being um, carved and constructed. And um, all in all, there are 36 of these. And I think Taylor and Carl Bitter traveled to um, inspect the work and to authorize it. Um, you have to always be careful about relying on um, newspapers because um, sometimes, you know, they get things just a little off. This is an example. While it's a very important article, and I love the fact that they were out inspecting, you know, the capitals. The, um, it states that the architect Isaac Taylor is standing in this photograph, and it's actually Carl Bitter that's standing in the photograph. They um, very different physical types. And, um, but the, the rest of the information we've been able to check and is pretty accurate. The, I mentioned earlier that David R. Francis was involved with everything. One of the things that um, the group did was that they hired Tiffany Studios to do some of the work uh, for the building. And um, the, the primary thing that they did were the beautiful bronze entry doors on both sides 
but they decided David R. Francis wanted to have a uh, Tiffany plaque for the building. And so he proposed this to the to the others. And it's it's interesting because Walter B. Stevens and others um, were very concerned, as was Francis, that they do this right, but that they stay within budget. And um, it states uh, that our obligations must not exceed our resources. And then they had various members of the executive committee sign the document that they supported the commissioning of the uh, Tiffany tablet if there was enough money to um, support that. And here's an image um, of the tablet that is um, adhered to the north entrance. And the close up with the signature of the Tiffany Studios from 1913. On February 8th of 1913, um, Governor Francis officially turned over the Jefferson Memorial Building uh, to the city of St. Louis. And uh, William K. Bixby is um, next to the mayor who's receiving the key. And um, so this is February 8th. Um, the, all of the celebrations and the um, unveiling and opening, you know, are, is going to occur on April 30th. And you can tell Thomas Jefferson is not done. <laughs> the, there's a number of people there uh, working on the carving. But on that same day that it was turned over uh, to the city, um, all of the um, board of governors and, and directors uh, from the fair were invited for a photo op in uh, the Jefferson Hall. On April 30th, uh, there was um, a banquet and at this point, they're calling it the Jefferson Memorial as opposed to the Jefferson Monument uh, like they did earlier. And uh, the invitation went out from Walter B. Stevens and David R. Francis, as you can see on the yeah. bottom part. There were quite a few festivities during uh, the, the opening ceremonies and the mayor announced a half day um, city holiday and encouraged um, employers to let people have a half day off so that they could um, attend the festivities. So here we have um, the dedication day parade um, coming west on Lindell. Uh, Christian brother uh, students uh, marching the parade past the new Jefferson Memorial and then uh, Sumner High School students uh, marching in front of the Jefferson Memorial. And um, here we have a temporary stage in front of the building with David R. Francis addressing the crowds. Um, this, uh, Mike and I were talking about this earlier, this photograph was used to commission a painting uh, uh, by Fred Green Carpenter, who also did one of the World's Fair murals in the building um, to commemorate uh, this scene. And um, it's estimated um, that a quarter of a million people participated in um, the various activities uh, surrounding the dedication. Um, a descendant of Thomas Jefferson, um, actually was the individual, a young woman that um, pulled the flag drape off of the statue uh, during the, the programming. The decorative work um, within the Jefferson Memorial is, is truly spectacular. And um, here you see some of the 36 capitals that we saw you know, being carved earlier. Um, as well as some of the terracotta uh, ornamentation. And in addition to the 
floral and leaf uh, motifs that you see in this image. On the north side of the loggia, there's a large um, terracotta Missouri State Seal. And on the south side of the loggia, there's an American Eagle uh, with a red, uh, white, and blue uh, shield. This is an image of one of the bronze doors by uh, Tiffany Studios, and also a, a detail from the original doorknobs uh, in the Jefferson Memorial Building. They um, all, the original doors um, included an image of, of Thomas Jefferson. Um, the pocket doors actually slide into the, the walls. So when the buildings open, the only thing that you see is the ornate work above the door. And on the west side uh, in the bronze, and that's what you see here, is uh, a very ornate intertwined LPE for the Louisiana Purchase Exposition. And on the east door, it's an intertwined MHS the Missouri Historical Society. Mm -hmm. um, the bronze doors um, cost $8,000 each when they were commissioned um, in today's dollars. Uh, to put it in context, $257,424 for each door. So over a half a million dollars in today's um, funds to commission these incredible doors, but um, they, they are truly uh, a treasure. And this is one of the staircases. The building, the original building was completely symmetrical. And so this is um, the stairs going up in the East Wing. Uh, originally they went up to the library and archives. Now they go up to um, administrative offices, but you can see the beautiful marble walls, the red uh, marble stairs, and the ornate um, newel post and banisters. And the bronze by Carl Bitter, which um, he had to pay to move to St. Louis. Um, this is a close-up of that, and it's the uh, the three individuals um, that were commemorated for the signing of the um, Louisiana Purchase. So we have um, Robert Livingston sitting in the center, uh, James Monroe standing, and then also standing uh, Francois uh, Marbois uh, signing the the document. Now, originally, as I mentioned, the um, Missouri Historical Society was just in the East Wing. Um, and the Civic Groups and Louisiana Purchase uh, Exposition Historical Association to, uh, occupied the um, Western um, Wing. In, in later years, the, um, the Muni Opera also used Jefferson Hall as rehearsal space. Um, the another um, early image um, that uh, this was during the First World War, and you see a lot of the architectural cases in the exhibition, and then um, along the columns, um, active uh, photographs of active servicemen. And an early flag day at the Jefferson Memorial, including people standing along the top, which is um, kind of a scary thought. Um, this oversized flag did go on a national train tour, and it was uh, photographed at a number of landmarks across the country. So here we have the um, first auditorium at the um, Missouri um, Historical Society. Um, that it later became library stacks, and um, 
the granite and uh, marble stage that you see uh, with the elaborate chairs is still there. It's offices now, but it uh, has been carefully preserved in case they ever want to uh, go back and use it um, for its original purpose. In 1927, uh, the Missouri Historical uh, Society received national attention um, when the young St. Louis-based aviator, uh, Charles Lindbergh, agreed to lend his trophies for 10 days. Um, the artifacts, remember the image of the um, East Wing where you saw all the flat cases with um, archeological items, they basically had some guards in the space and they put the trophies on top of those cases. And so for those 10 days, it was just kind of spread out. Um, uh, one of the local newspapers estimated that in the first um, um, four days of the exhibit, that 116,000 people came to see the trophies. There was talk about people standing in line, you know, for hours. Um, the Lindbergh later, because of the incredible interest, um, decided to extend the loan. He extended it several different times. And in fact, in 1928, um, the city government um, voted to turn over the West Wing of the Jefferson Memorial to the Historical Society in order to ensure that the Lindbergh collection would stay in St. Louis. And um, as a um, the consequence, they um, worked with a number of local companies and did fundraising uh, to build these cases that you see in the um, West Wing and notice the World's Fair murals uh, on the second floor. The, um, the new exhibition in the West Wing where things were no longer, you know, sitting on top of the archeological cases um, was officially opened in, uh, on October 30th of 1928. <clears throat> And then um, 1939, um, a major uh, WPA project with the enclosure of the River de Pere, um, which you know had caused quite a bit of um, flooding. And it, you can see here how close that came to the Jefferson Memorial. And it fairly recently was named um, a National Engineering Historic Landmark. The, just a quick um, overview of some of the early um, exhibits after that period. This was installed in 1961 in the Golden Eagle Pilot House. Um, an early exhibit about the uh, mound builders. Um, the old Lammert Gallery, uh, which uh, includes a um, painting of a buffalo hunt by Carl Weimar. And the Jefferson Memorial is only, the original building was only 38,000 square feet. And so a lot of spaces were used for exhibits over the years. So weren't really exhibit areas. And this here you see um, that same staircase that we were looking at earlier. And, um, you know, there's all sorts of things hanging on the walls. There's sculptures and landings. And then um, the wedding garments uh, from Auguste Chouteau and uh, Marie-Therese Serre are in that little case there in the corner. By the 1960s, they knew they needed to expand, and the Women's Association was very active and, in my opinion, was the reason that the Historical Society 
survived during the 60s and 70s. They raised money through the flea market and through the country store and other activities, and they built an underground addition on the back of the um, Jefferson Memorial Building, and it included some gallery space, um, offices, uh, collection storage. Another image of the outdoor courtyard, which later was converted into an indoor space um, and used for exhibitions. And then probably the biggest um, our most significant event in the history of the Missouri Historical Society occurred on November 3rd of 1987, and that's when citizens of St. Louis um, City and of St. Louis County voted to um, admit the History Museum into the Zoo Museum Taxing District. And suddenly, the institution that had been struggling financially had a base level of operating support that um, allowed it to um, essentially um, bring things up to current standards. And soon after um, joining uh, the ZMD, and this is sometimes, you know, um, hard to remember how much things have changed, but here you see kind of the egg-shaped island that the Jefferson Memorial sat on uh, with parking all the way around it, the underground um, behind it. And shortly after um, joining the ZMD, the History Museum subdistrict purchased the former United Hebrew Temple on Skinker on the west side uh, of the park and um, renovated that and added on collection storage so that the library and research center could be um, created there. Um, and after that was complete and the collections were moved, then uh, work began on the new addition to the um, uh, Missouri History Museum itself. And so in 2000, the um, 91,000 square foot Emerson Center was added to the back of the Jefferson Memorial. And this was designed by Gio Abata. Um, the addition included the 340 seat auditorium, which I know your organization has used a number of times. Uh, here you see in the Grand Hall, um, the installation of the river mosaic um, under construction, and the addition allowed for museum amenities that just weren't possible uh, in the Jefferson Memorial Building, such as um, classrooms and um, um, a cafe, you know, etc. The Spirit of St. Louis sister plane. Um, a year younger than the original Spirit of St. Louis, but also built by Ryan, was brought back from Lam Lambert uh, Airport and installed in the Grand Hall. And one of those great coincidences was that opening weekend was uh, just a few weeks after um, the Rams uh, won the Super Bowl. And so they had been thinking about where they were going to place the Lombardi trophy so that people could come and see it. And they decided to do it at the newly expanded History Museum, which this, this was in February. And despite the cold weather, people stood in line for hours, sometimes with the line going outside the building uh, to see it. And, you know, a Lombardi trophy in St. Louis is a rare thing, and so everybody wanted to see it. <laughs> so um, today, the Missouri History Museum hosts approximately 300,000 people a year. We've had um, years when we were much higher than that. Um, and then most recently during the pandemic, we had years when we were much lower than that. But on the average, um, about 300,000 uh, people a year. Um, 
We host a variety of educational programs, exhibits, lectures, et cetera. And um, the, you know, but things, you know, have changed over time. Um, there's changes in interpretation. And, you know, a good example is that when the Jefferson statue was first unveiled, uh, David R. Francis um, gave some remarks and said, behold, one of the immortals. Um, over the years, um, his legacy has become more complicated. And the, you know, in, in recent years with the removal of a number of Confederate statues and things, we received um, hate mail about the fact that we had Jefferson uh, in the loggia. And one of the things that we decided to do was to put together a um, committee to study it and to talk about um, how it should be interpreted. And we had educators and museum professionals and um, high school students that worked in on various components of this. And the decision was made to, um, um, you know, put it in context and to, give people information and quotes from both sides of the issue. And we ended up by adding three interpretive panels, uh, one dealing with the Jefferson Memorial, uh, one dealing with freedom and enslavement, because you can't avoid that, uh, talking about Jefferson, and one dealing with his role in uh, the expansion with the Louisiana Purchase, but also the removal of indigenous people um, from, from this area. And it's it's been interesting. People spend a lot of time with these panels. And I think uh, some people were very concerned, but after they've seen them and read them, most people feel that it's a fair treatment. And we're trying not to tell people what they should think, but make sure that they have the information, you know, to draw their their own conclusion. The um, there are other changes that will be coming and um, we will be um, starting work this coming Monday, August 21st, on renovations to the um, North Plaza of the, the History Museum. And these will occur over the next eight months and then by late April uh, in time uh, for some special events at the, the History Museum. The, uh, the plan is to have this reopen. It's addressing a number of issues, including um, accessibility as well as safety. And the fountain will remain, but there will no longer be the awkward steps uh, around it. Um, those of you pretty familiar with the building remember the short, long steps. And these were awkward for people. And we had a number of falls. And our insurance company has been asking for some time when we're going to take those out. Um, and the, but in order to take them out, we have to change the. Um, um, the plaza in the elevation so that it's it's flatter. So the, the steps outside the front, there will actually be a couple additional steps there so that the plaza itself um, can be um, flat and events and things occur there. Um, we do a lot of um, work with different organizations, including uh, the 1904 World's Fair Society, and we're currently doing a lot of digitization. Um, the And I wanted just to spend a minute or two talking about the long history of, of collaboration between both originally the Missouri Historical Society and the Louisiana Purchase Exposition Company. A lot of the original planning for the World's Fair um, took place at the Missouri Historical Society, and they did a lot of the very early work 
there. It wasn't until 1899 that uh, David R. Francis became um, the, the lead person on the fair. And all of that is mentioned uh, in the, the minute books of the, the historical society. But as they separated into two separate organizations there, the LPE and um, MHS, there still was a lot of collaboration. And MHS members remained involved. And there is a great deal of overlap between the two boards. Um, after the fair and his work to wrap up the LPE uh, and responsibilities, David R. Francis joined the board of the Missouri Historical Society um, in 1911, and he served as the president of the board from 1914 until 1925. Mm -hmm. Now, you're probably thinking, okay, there were a few years there when he was in Russia, and um, that's true, but he remained president of the Missouri <laughs> Historical Society, which is kind of interesting. But he and William K. Bixby kind of shared a lot of the activities, and um, William K. Bixby, um, who served as chair before as well as after David R. Francis um, was, um, you know, helped make that happen. But, you know, the transformative role that David R. Francis had, you know, for both organizations just really can't be overstated. And um, the, the two organizations merged in 1925. Um, the Missouri Historical Society and the Louisiana Purchase Historical Association, which was the, the next version of the LPE group, determined that it was mutually advantageous uh, for the two corporations to unite and to consolidate uh, their property and assets. And so that ended up happening. The, um, the articles of association are kind of fun reading. And um, the, there are a couple requirements, one being the establishment of a library of books and publications appropriate to such a combined institution uh, with convenient works of reference and a cabinet of, of antiquity. And um, then it also requires that the Missouri Historical Society, um, which was going to be the name of the combined um, organizations, would have a safe and permanent depository of manuscripts, documents, papers, tracts, objects, articles, materials, possessing historical and or biographical and or genealogical and or archaeological value, including the archives of the Louisiana Purchase Exposition Company, the plans, the records, the reports, exposition literature, and other matters of historical and educational value. Um, we often get the question as to whether or not we're required to have um, a World's Fair exhibition. And the Articles of Incorporation do not require an exhibition, but they do require that we do all of those things I just mentioned. Um, and we don't usually call our exhibits cabinets of antiquities now, but we try to have them be a little bit more interpretive. But um, with that said, the organization does, you know, have um, World's Fair exhibitions, and I don't see that that changing. Um, in the past forty plus years, where I've been at the Missouri Historical Society, we have had um, four different um, World's Fair exhibitions, including the one that's currently. Uh, being worked on that will open uh, the end of April of 2024. And this is the relatively new image, um, computer-generated image of the um, 
the new um, exhibition. And I think it's um, pretty exciting um, that it will have um, you know a scale model of all of the buildings um, in the in the fair. And we recently had the opportunity, and I know some of it has shown up, you know, in social media to see a couple of the buildings, including Festival Hall, um, with the um, um, projection on it that shows movement and people walking and various things. And it's just, it's pretty fascinating. And so I I know that everybody here this evening, you know, is is interested in the in the fair. And I think that you will really enjoy um, the new interpretation. The um, thank you. It's been nice visiting with you about it this evening. <laughs> the that's owned by the society it was purchased in 1991 from the company that manufactured it who ended up as a board dissolved and they were absorbed by someone else a dentist ended up with it up in milwaukee and after a couple of years of searching, the World's Fair Society found it up there and made him an offer. And he went, no, I don't think so. Uh, Linda, you were, you know, I don't know if you remember then. Are there any char other charter members here? Okay, you probably, oh, Cherry, you probably remember. And Mark, you know, fundraisers that were made to uh, come up with the money to purchase that thing. Uh, was brought down here. It was unveiled over at the mm -hmm. Library Research Center. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, Pretty cool. Yep. And it'll go in the new exhibit. And uh, uh, as part of this overall new thing, and you know, I'm sure you can see the layout of the World's Fair with you know some of the towers there. Uh, the Ferris wheel model would go right about here, but it's not there yet. <laughs> yep. uh, in this drawing or mock-up, or mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure. That's not a photograph. I think the people were maybe photoshopped. Yeah. Put in there, yeah. But uh, you know, exhibits around the side, a lot of them will be interactive and stuff. Uh, I'm really excited about that. Are there some other questions, Doug? Do you have anything from the uh, internet? No questions from the internet. Okay, if uh, people on uh, Zoom have any questions, please enter them into the uh, chat area. And there was a question in back. Was that I think Mark? Oh, any chance of zooming in on that? Um, Yes. Okay. Uh, I want to change the uh, screen share here. Um, okay. And share screen. I want to go to PowerPoint. Go ahead. Um, you mentioned where the Missouri Historical Society met at um, uh, close to the Campbell House. Could you repeat what that place was? I mean, quite oh, close. the um, in the early years they just moved around public right. buildings, and then they purchased the old Larkin Mansion, Larkin, okay. mm -hmm, which um, was on. Lucas Place at that time. Okay. Um, now would have been Locus. Okay. It's renamed. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. It's probably about as much Zoom as I can get without losing more resolution. Mm, yeah. It's starting to fall apart. <laughs> um, Karen, I have a question for you. In mm -hmm. your, uh, I've only been here since 90, about 1990, mm -hmm. and I've seen different uh, exhibits come and go and different presidents and emphasis and stuff like that. I've been very impressed the last eight or 10 years uh, with all the, I think, very interesting exhibits that they brought in. And I'd like to ask if you have any favorites that you either thought were the most popular or that you really liked. 
put you um, on the spot here. Yeah. The um well, there's a number of ex exhibitions that I've really liked. Um there was an exhibit um that was probably the second World's Fair exhibit while I was there. Um, it was curated um, by a historian named Kathy Corbett. And she told the story, and it was actually on both levels um, of the, the West Wing. And she um, selected, I think it was 12 individuals to tell the story from their point of view. And some of them were very prominent people, like a woman, um, Florence Hayward, Hayward. Uh, on the uh, Board, Board of, of Governors. Of the, um, there was a little boy, and he was one of my favorites, Ferdinand Herr, who um, sold um, papers at the, the fair and, you know, had his little work permit and stuff and was very young very young um and his daughters um after they retired both volunteered at the historical society which was was pretty neat and until they passed away but um you know it it dealt with all sorts of things including that elaine beats was a popular a uh, writer for the Post at the time, and she did um, just a little film about there being no there there about the um, um, meet me in St. Louis and what was true about the fair and what wasn't and what the Kensington Place House really looked like versus yeah you know and so there there were very serious components dealing with you know people who were on display, as well as, you know, fun things like the Elaine Beats uh, piece. But it, um, I think, really provided um, just a great overview of the fair. And I think the new exhibition, while it will be quite different, will also provide the opportunity to really get a lot of in-depth mm -hmm. knowledge. Well, I remember that, and I got to go up to the balcony, and in one corner, there was one of the big Singer tapestries of the exploration of the Mississippi that was done in needlework, fabric, and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And I asked uh, Adam and uh, Sam Moore, how come you're not going to use the balcony this time? Because there used to be an elevator that would take there people used to up be an to the elevator. balcony, a temporary elevator. Yeah. And they said, OSHA. Yep. Yeah, the we actually back for the exhibit that I was just talking about, we had to add about um, 12 inches to the railing that circled uh, Jefferson Hall. And now that's not even enough. Oh, really? yeah. So, I mean, it's 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 OK for office use up there, but not for the general public. Mm -hmm. So. Is there anywhere that there are photos of the four or the three exhibits that have come before that? So I'm I'm familiar with the most previous, mm -hmm. the current one, uh, but it made me curious if it's probably where they went. The first one looks like mm -hmm. there there are some photos, uh, not as many as we would like, um, but there um, are some articles. You know, written about some of those those early ones, and I could um, get you um, some references to those. Yes, so we're. I'm assuming that the recordings that you talked about still exist, but they wouldn't consider putting them into the new exhibit. What recordings are you talking? The recordings of what you were talking about with people that had gone to the. Oh oh um, oh! From that exhibit. Mm -hmm. The um, well, a lot of them were people that were no longer, you know, they they couldn't actually be interviewed because they they weren't with us anymore. And so the um, um, but there's quite a bit of the the text and stuff that's still available. Um, and I can share with Mike, you know, some of those references, and he can 
share them with the group. Um, but um, there's, you know, been quite a bit written, some of it pretty disturbing about, you know, what was sometimes viewed as entertainment then. <laughs> Oh, um, the stairs that you were talking about are those from the original building? Yes, and they they will be reinstalled, but there will be two additional stair treads that, um, in fact, we were looking at um, stone samples this morning because we're trying to match that that granite as as closely as possible to. Um, so that we can have the um, um, new elevation, you know, on the front plaza. Mark. Carol, in the hundred years, every other Sunday, I was volunteer in the galleries. It was many years of management. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite things was I really admired what you spoke about before. The uh, four Tiffany Brown's prophets leading the valley of the prophet. Every once in a while, I had to pull them out 40, 50 in my ear. So, how beautiful this would look if one of these were polished. It's a special event some days, but it's kind of good to talk really about this polishing one of them. It's a possibility. The, we, we've looked into it. Um, it's actually controversial, if you can believe that. Conservators do not want anything that's going to take the patina off because it actually takes some of the bronze off. And to polish it, you have to make those compromises. So at this point in time, and it could change someday in the future, this point in time it's decided has been decided not to to shine them up. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> the, but someday in the future, you know, a different um decision might be made. We've got three online questions. Oh, okay. No. Uh, Perrin's asking, was there a room in the basement of the original building that had a historic library, and is it still there? Okay. Um, the original building, the library was upstairs. Um, there was a room in the basement that held um, historic bound newspapers, and they... Um, you know, the library staff, you know, there weren't elevators. They'd have to go down to the lowest level and they they were huge volumes. Um, they're now on microfilm, uh, but that was, was in the basement. But the uh, library itself, as well as the archives were on the second floor. And we have a question from Diane. What was displayed in the West Wing before the Lindbergh exhibit was placed there? And uh, are there any photos? The, um, the Lindbergh was actually the first exhibit in the West Wing um, because we essentially, the Historical Society took over the West Wing to house the Lindbergh exhibit to keep it in St. Louis because there there was competition the Smithsonian wanted it and you know and we really wanted to keep it here um I actually wasn't here then so but the <laughs> historical society wanted to keep it here the um but the prior to that was when it was being used um for lectures as well as in um rehearsal space for the Muni Opera. In fact, there are a couple letters to the editor in the um, in 1928 where people were saying, well, you can't turn that over to the Historical Society for the Lindbergh exhibit because that's where the Muni rehearses. Um, and the fact was that there were a lot of other places the Muni could rehearse, but you know, the um, but 
the Lindbergh exhibit was actually the first exhibit in that space. Hmm. And one last question. Do you know the cost of the new model or an estimate of it? Um, I've seen it and um, it is shockingly expensive. <laughs> and um, I'm not sure enough of the exact price to quote you, but I know that before the exhibit opens, that you know, we'll we'll have an actual number, and it will <laughs> no doubt show up in the newspaper. <laughs> I can tell you uh, that that scale model uses some fairly modern technology that has advanced even since Doug uh, was doing his engineering work of uh, 3D printing. Yes. How many of you have ever seen a 3D printer make something neat and small? Okay, so where do you get the computer file to generate a 3D image of, say, the Palace of Manufacturers? Uh, you got pictures and you got to make it. <laughs> and that's where probably a lot of that labor goes. Yes. The, uh, it's kind of easy to make a block diagram of the building, mm -hmm. round domes and stuff like that. But it amazes me if you've ever used Google Earth and you can see every building downtown in the right color with all the windows in the right place to scale and you move around and it, you know, does it, you know, I don't know how they do that. But uh, there are obviously people a lot smarter than me that know how to use photographs and tools mm -hmm. to make all those little scale models. Get it? What other what other displays have you got besides the World's Fair? They're coming up. Hmm. The um so let's see. Um after the current architecture exhibit closes, um coloring St. Louis, after that there will be an exhibition in that space called Collected that deals with the various collections since 1866 that the Historical Society uh, has brought in. And the one of the things that, you know, some some of our staff are kind of calling it the secret life of artifacts, but the it's, you know, people want to know what the coolest stuff in the collection is. And so the curators are kind of, you know, trying to pull those sorts of things together. And um, right now, one of the ones that's at the top of the list because they're having people vote on various things. We have Anna, the gray wolf. Do people remember Anna? Uh, from the um, wolf sanctuary. But she was single-handedly responsible for the gray wolf not becoming extinct. And um, and so there's all these books and things written about her. And when she died, she was taxidermied. And people are going to be able to come visit her, which is all a little weird. But um, the but then, you know, there's there's things, you know, like in St. Louis that people don't expect, like um, the. Um, one of Admiral Perry's dog sleds is in our collection because one of his uh, expeditions was underwritten by Simmons Hardware. Hmm. And so he brought it back as a souvenir. And so, you know, there's things like that. And so it's, it's going to be a different but fun, you know, sort of um, exhibition. And then, you know, there's you know, soccer will be here still for another, hmm, let's see. Until they win the championship. Well, no, <laughs> um, I think next spring, maybe early summer. And then um, there's actually an exhibit that's being curated that um, is going to deal in that space with the, the history of the LGBTQIA um, plus um, in St. Louis. And then there's 
going long term, there's going to be an exhibit on immigration and different different things. And so there's a lot of stuff on the in the works. One of the ones that I think will be really cool that will replace currents and reflections, the two exhibits on the second floor. And it's going to be Gallery STL, and it will probably have a better name than that before too much longer. But it's going to be a decade by decade history of um, St. Louis, so that each decade from the founding up to the present time will have a you know case, and it will deal with what's been determined to be one of the most significant things of that decade, plus other things about everyday life and stuff. And I must admit, that's one that I'm very excited about. It's it's gonna be late in the 20s. I mean, probably 28, <laughs> you know, before that one opens, but people are already working on it full time and doing extra collecting and, and different things, so. Yeah. The yes, and um, there will be a case in collected dealing with with Lindbergh. Yeah. Last question. That was my connection too. Is there anything planned for the hundredth anniversary of Lindbergh's life? The, the yeah. Um, it's most likely. The uh, it's um, certainly under discussion, and we have uh, some staff members that are serving on a national committee about the commemoration and and stuff. And so, the it probably won't be as big as it was, you know, in the twenties and thirties when it was actually the biggest tourism draw, you know, in St. Louis going through the old Chamber of Commerce stuff is fun because it always says the Lindbergh trophies and um, Jefferson Memorial was known as the home of the Lindbergh trophies and, and stuff. And so there's a lot of interesting things with that, but yeah, it'll definitely be commemorated. So, well, I'd like to sorry. thank Karen. Answering the questions, oh. I think, with the clarity and clarity, et cetera. Uh, I'm, but you have a chore to do now. Oh, I have a chore? Yes, okay. you can put that on the table over there, and you can start pulling names out. Okay. And uh, we have eight attendance prizes. And if your name is called, you can come up and pick one off the table and maybe stand in front of the table, or let's stand behind the table. And Doug, would you get the lights on uh, when you go back there? In no, front, no, no. and I'm going to turn the camera. Oh. I hope. And Cheryl will be taking pictures too, I'm sure. Okay. The first winner is Josie Strasberger. Okay, come on up and we'll pick one. Go ahead and pick another day. Ed Magoo. I'm coming to Joseph. You would step back here. Yeah, I think. Reba Davis. Mark Eisenberg. Yeah. Questionnaire. Steve Schmidt. Hey, Steve. Now, tall people kind of on the back row and uh, the less tall people in the front row. Carol, um, is it Kepi? Carol, Carol Kepi. Mm -hmm. Okay. No name. Yeah. 
We're going to ask you to, you know, stand there too. Uh, Mark Oliver. One more name. One more name. Drum roll. Uh, Pat Hotsey. Pat Hotsey. Ms. Kelsey, if you would uh, get everyone positioned appropriately. Step forward a little bit if you would. Mark, let's get a little bit. Step forward a little bit oh. so there's room behind you and they can shoot in. Let's see, follow suit. I'm trying to get away from this. Yeah, I'm trying to get away from this. There's a box here. Stand on the box. Yeah. <laughs> Steve, could you go into the other corner? Oh, oh you can't. It's the 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 speaker. Okay, y'all. Wait a minute. Wait. I can scoot down a little bit. Now everybody say cheese. Cheese. <laughs> 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 Okay, so as we wrap up here, on time and on schedule, more or less, um, I want to tell you about the upcoming events and meetings. I'll let everyone get back to their seat. We'll have some time afterwards, maybe 15 minutes or so, for more questions while we pack up. We do have to be out of here by, before 8 o'clock, so by 10 of. Um, I will start herding the cats and tell everyone it's time to get going. Okay, so on Saturday, September 2nd, as of when I wrote this a couple hours ago, there were still a few seats left on the buses for an opportunity to take. Can everybody hear me okay over the talking? Okay. Can I ask everyone to be quiet for about three minutes? Please be quiet for three minutes. Thank you. Oh, I forgot about that. Now everyone better be quiet. <laughs> okay, on Saturday, September 2nd, uh, as of an hour ago, there were a few seats left on the bus. We're now full. And Doug, we have people signed up on the waiting list already? Not yet, but I'm ready to take their names. Okay, uh, there's a good chance that with 24 people in each uh, tour, that two or three people will probably cancel between now and then. Uh, there's a $15 payment, and that's for a light snack and donations to both the cemetery and the society. Dan Fuller will take the tour, a trolley bus through uh, Bell Fountain Cemetery to see the final resting places of famous St. Louisans who helped organize and run the Louisiana Purchase Exposition. And on Sunday, September 24th at Francis Park, society members will staff a double tent at Art in the Park as we did last year. How many people like going to art shows? Okay, I expect all the ladies at least to raise your hand. Okay. How many people worked on in our tent last year? Did you have a good time? Okay. It's a great chance to tell throngs of visitors about the world's greatest fair and to mingle with society members. And then in October, on Tuesday, October 10th, back here at six o'clock at Booter Library, we'll have our annual Members Are the Program meeting who knows what that is show and tell yes you guys have been around for a few years show and tell so start looking through your collection see if there's anything neat you want to share and show people uh etc and maybe we'll ask karen to come and see if she can bring a couple things from the history museum that's a joke karen <laughs> uh Okay, one last call. Does anyone have any other questions for Karen or information about the World's Fair and society and events are happening? Yes, Mark. Real quick. 
Okay, uh, we'll have time for some one on one conversations with Karen and myself and other people uh, when we're done. Uh, I also want to tell people that if you're interested in collecting memorabilia, uh, a person here has some information and she's the one that was taking photographs. Cher, would you stand up? Uh, there's going to be an auction from a major collector coming up and we don't advertise auctions, but she's got some pieces of paper that she may want to tell you about if you're interested. So I want to thank everybody for coming and please drive home safely and uh, have a good time, and I hope to see you at uh, either on the tour or at Art in the Park or at Booter Library here on Tuesday, October 10th. Thanks for coming.